In this chapter, Russell explicitly states that what he's trying to do is answer the question, how are we to know which of our, which of our beliefs are true? And you know, if he's doing that, he's going about it kind of a, a sideways uh, away. <laughs> uh, so what he explicitly does, or you know, the conclusion that he reaches at the end of this chapter, is uh, this distinction between knowledge, error, and probable opinion. So uh, if he's answering the question, how are we to know which of our beliefs are true, then what he's doing is saying, look, here's the three kinds of beliefs that we have, or at least the three kinds of true, uh, three, three kinds of uh, beliefs that we firmly hold, right? And uh, uh, if your belief is knowledge, then it's true. If it's uh, error, then it's false. If it's probable opinion, then eh, we don't really know. Uh, so if he's doing that, he's, again, he's going about it very sideways. At least what he's explicit, uh, at least what he or actually accomplishes what he really gets done in, in this chapter is provide this distinction between knowledge, error, and probable opinion. So I think it's probably best to think that what he's trying to do in this chapter is tell us well, what is knowledge compared to error and probable opinion. His answer is that knowledge is a firmly held belief as true, as derived either, uh, it's either derived, it's either derivative knowledge, or it's intuition. And that, that intuition is uh, an intuition held to the highest degree of self-evidence. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, that, that's kind of piecing it uh, all together there. Uh, and we're going to take a look at this, uh, again, piece by piece. So maybe the first question we want to ask is, why do we bother with knowledge as opposed, you know, why do we have all these qualifications with knowledge. Why don't you say that true belief is knowledge? Well, uh, you know, we can have all kinds of true beliefs, but uh, not have any reasons for them, right? Uh, somebody who can just go around making lucky guesses, right, would have uh, a true belief, but we don't think that's knowledge. When we think we have knowledge, we think that we have at least some kind of justification for that. So, you know, suppose, uh, you know, I take my lucky, I take my magic eight ball, right? I got my magic eight ball, and I asked the magic eight ball, hey, magic eight ball. You know, I take it and I shake it and I say, hey, magic eight ball, uh, will it rain today? And you know, I shake it and it comes up and says, it is certainly so. And I say, oh, wow, great, it's going to rain. And so I grab my umbrella and I walk outside and it happens to be raining. Well, we don't think that's knowledge. We think that's just luck. Uh, if we want knowledge, we want to have uh, some kind of justification for it. If it's just true belief, you know, you could, you know, just get lucky, but not have any justification. So that's the first question that Russell kind of Russell kind of sets aside is whether true belief is not so like, no, right? You need something more than true belief. You need to have reason. You need to have some kind of justification. So the second question to ask is why do we have uh, why are we dealing with uh, uh, why do we include uh, uh, derivation and intuition? Why not just have uh, derivation? Well, you know, derivation is one very obvious kind of reasoning, so hey, we're, we're going to include that. Well, what about you know, intuition? Well, uh, all, as we discussed in that chapter on intuitive knowledge, derivations are at some point going to rest on some kind of a priori justification, on some kind of intuitive knowledge. So we can't just have this, you know, just to kind of recall some of the arguments, we can't just have this infinite regress of reasons. Human minds don't work that way. Our minds are finite. So if we keep going back with our derivation, we're going to stop at some point. Right? You know, the two big principles that Russell talks about where we, we don't have any further justification for them, they're justified a priori, will be the principle of inference and the principle of induction. Right? Those, are, those are two big ones. And, you know, something he said time and time again, all knowledge, <laughs> all derivations rest on those two principles at some point. So, uh, you're going to have derivative knowledge, sure, that's going to be included in our conception of knowledge, but not just uh, derivations, you're also going to have to have intuitions. What Russell has left us with is this kind of a taxonomy of beliefs. Right? So what all three of these kinds of beliefs have in common is that they're firmly held. All right? So we'll have that at the top. The next division we'll look at is truth versus error, right? Uh, yeah, or truth versus false. If the belief is true, right, so we're headed in the direction of knowledge. But if it's false, 
Right? The belief is false, that's just error. It doesn't matter what kind of justification you have for it. If the belief is false, it's error. Okay. So that's uh, one distinction. The next distinction is whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's known through derivation or through intuition. If it's not known through either one of those, it's merely a true belief. And as we just said, mere true beliefs are not knowledge. So then we look at the kind of uh, justification beyond that, right? Is it you know, how it's right? So is it deri we got derivation, we got intuition. At bottom, you know, all derivation is going to rest on intuition. So the next distinction is whether this deri this uh, intuition right, has the highest degree of self-evidence right, or uh, something less than the highest degree of self-evidence. If it's the highest degree of self-evidence, it's knowledge. If it's less than that, it's probable opinion. That's something that Russell talks about. Uh, you know, he, he gives kind of some examples here and there, and he kind of alludes to, to this, that knowledge is not an all-or-nothing affair, right? When we've got, uh, we've got knowledge compared to probable opinion, well, there's going to be some degree uh, of self-evidence. So there's going to be some kind of like this gradient scale of knowledge. Now, he's not clear where the line is, and that's just something that's probably going to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. <clears throat> but when we're dealing with knowledge, it says knowledge that has the highest degree of self-evidence contrasted to something that, something uh, less than the highest degree. If it's less than the highest degree, it's just probable knowledge. Without any kind of uh, der derivation or intuition, it's just true belief. And if it's false, then you have error. Finally, the question that Russell leaves us with is what's supposed to be this difference uh, in the degree of self-evidence? Well, he gives two major kinds of self-evidence. The first is uh, self-evident self in the sense that uh, the subject is acquainted with the fact. Now, remember in the previous chapter, we had uh, this uh, uh, correspondence theory of truth, where you have the subject you have the fact and you have the correspondence between them. And when there's the correspondence between the subject and the fact, or between the belief and the fact, I should say, between the belief and the fact, then you have truth. Without the correspondence, it's false. Now, that's just a mere true belief so far. Now, if we add acquaintance with the fact, then we have this first kind of guarantee of self-evidence. Acquaintance with the fact, we have that first kind of guarantee of self-evidence. The example that Russell gives is Desdemona's love for Cassio. Now, Desdemona is acquainted with her feeling with Cassio, so she's acquainted with that fact. Interesting enough, she's the only person acquainted with that fact, since it's Desdemona's feelings. So Russell has this you know, uh, a somewhat mysterious passage where, a, uh, at most, one person is acquainted with any particular. <laughs> okay. Uh, but we got lots of kind, you know, lest we think that the only knowledge we have is about our own feelings or, or, or about our own, uh, what we get through acquaintance um, in, in the particular facts, right? Uh, we, you know, he reminds us that everybody has acquaintance with the universals. So when we deal with the universals and the relations between them, we are acquainted with those facts. So 2 plus 2 equals 4. We're acquainted with that fact because it, it's a universal. All right. So that's the highest degree of self-evidence. What about the other kind, when you get something less than highest? Well, the, the, the example that Russell's gives, they're, they're a little bit interesting. Um, there's not the most obvious criterion involved. And what he says is that just because we're acquainted with a fact does not mean we're absolutely certain of its truth. So this leads to an interesting distinction between the first kind of self-evidence and the second kind of self-evidence. The first kind has to deal with acquaintance. The second kind has to deal with something like um, confidence, maybe, is a probably a good word there. So whether we're confident in our acquaintance with the fact or confident in that belief. So this second kind of self-evidence, I think it's fair to say, deals with uh, certainty in the sense of confidence in a belief. So I am really confident that the sun is shining right now. I mean, I can't shake the confidence in that belief. I'm not acquainted with that fact. This, and this is an example that Russell gives. Uh, the fact would be the sun and the earth and the weather and the relationship of the sun to the weather and everything else like that. That would be that fact. But I'm not acquainted with any of that. I'm acquainted with my sense data. That's fine. Right? And I'm acquainted with uh, the principle of induction. So I'm going to infer from uh, um, induction that uh, since I see the sun shining, that the sun is shining. Right? That, that's okay. 
So I'm acquainted with perhaps that universal of, of, of induction, but the universal is not the sun. The principle of induction is not the sun. So I am not acquainted with the sun. So there's a difference between acquaintance and certainty. You can very definitely be certain, but not be acquainted. And there's probably going to be a difference between, uh, and, and Russell hints at this, I mean, from the opening sentence, you can be acquainted with the fact, with the universal relationship between them. doesn't mean you're certain. So what we have here is we have this interesting relationship. We have the first kind of this guaranteed self-evidence, that's acquaintance with the fact. We have the second kind of guarantee of self-evidence, and uh, sorry, the second kind of self-evidence, and that's the certainty or confidence. So we've got th those two kinds. Well, let's also add in true, right? So let's talk about these uh, beliefs as true. Now, if we have, it, it's impossible, at least given what Russell said here, it's impossible to have uh, any beliefs that are not true and guaranteed. So those, so that area, that, that's empty, right? That's, that's an empty area. We don't have any beliefs that are guaranteed. We're acquainted with the fact and it's not true. Where we have knowledge is where we have this intersection between the absolute guarantee, right, the first kind, and the second kind. We have the certainty and, the, and you know, superfluous at this point, the truth. When we have anything outside the truth, outside of the certainty, outside of the truth, outside of the guarantee, well, that, that's just an error. Now, if we can be, you know, since there's this you know, distance, there's this difference between certainty and this guarantee, I'm really sure, and you know, Russell, and I think it's fair to say, given the examples that Russell has given uh, through the rest of the book, that you can be certain about beliefs that are false. Well, those, that's just error too. Well, what do we have left? If we, have, if we are outside, completely outside any kind of guarantee and any kind of certainty, well, that means that we don't have any kind of justification whatsoever. Right? We have no reason for the true belief. So that's just merely a true belief. Well, what about the situation where we have uh, the guarantee, but we're lacking the certainty. Right. Well, that, that's something explicitly covered by Russell, and in that case, that's a probable opinion. Now, what, what's left when we have the certainty, but not the guarantee? Um, I, given the examples that Russell has provided, you know, especially later on in the book, I want to say uh, that if we have the certainty, but not the guarantee of truth, I would say that that's also probable opinion. That looks like what, what, what that is, is probable opinion. Now, certainty is held to a matter of degree. Okay, so we got this sliding scale from certainty down to true belief. And you know, this is, this coheres with what Russell says so far. Knowledge, you know, we're sort of way comes, comes uh, as a matter of degree. But what about this guarantee? Is, you know, we're either acquainted with the fact or not. I mean, yes and no. It sure seems like acquaintance with a fact uh, can be had to a degree as well. So when we're looking at the universals and the relations between universals, something like 2 plus 2 equals 4, I'm acquainted with 2, addition, 4, inequality. Okay, so I'm acquainted with every constituent of that fact. But in the case with Desdemona, Los Casio, Desdemona is not acquainted with every constituent of that fact. Okay? Desdemona is acquainted with herself, she's acquainted with love, but she's not acquainted with Cassio, given what Russell has to say. So if, uh, if that's the case, then you what? Desdemona is acquainted with two-thirds of the, the constituents of the fact. But Russell still wants to allow that as something, uh, uh, as, a, uh, uh, as, as a fact that she's directly acquainted with. Okay. Now, uh, I don't know, we, we talked earlier, uh, um, we talked earlier, and I said the last, the last section had this example of the chair on top of the table, or the trash can on top of the table. Now, I'm not acquainted with the trash can, I'm not acquainted with the table, but I'm acquainted with on top of. That's a relation. So, in that case, I'm acquainted with only one-third of the constituents of the fact. So, uh, acquaintance with the fact can come in degrees when you're considering the constituents of the fact. Now, whether or not Russell really wants to admit this, it's hard to say, uh, given this text. I think there's room for it. And I think it would, in the end, probably help what he has to say about knowledge. Um, so, you know, just for kicks and grins, we're going to say there's a sliding scale between uh, um, going from this uh, first kind of certainty down to true belief. When you have, uh, or excuse me, first kind of uh, self-evidence down to true belief, when you have, you know, the degree of acquaintance with the constituents of the fact. 
So as a final kind of exercise in understanding what Russell has to say here, go back and look at the examples that he uh, uh, provides in the text and try your best to determine uh, where the uh, first kind of guarantee of truth fits in, and this, or the first kind of self-evidence fits in, and the second kind of self-evidence fits in. And that through this way, I think you'll be able to better understand what Russell has to say. Now, a lot of what Russell has to say here regarding knowledge, error, and probable opinion leads directly into the topic of the next chapter, and that's the limits of philosophical knowledge. Now, you know, without ruining the surprise too much, given what he has to say about knowledge, error, and probable opinion, philosophy, philosophical knowledge, probably not going to count as knowledge.